Welcome to Old Path and our study through the Old Testament book of Psalms. We are at Psalm 69 and we'll, um, we'll cover Psalm 69 and 70 today. And um, just let me set up, if I can, uh, Psalm 69. This is one of, the, one of the places that you'll find in the scripture, and there are so many of them, uh, where a person writing in the New Testament will take a section of uh, a particular book or a particular uh, you know, chapter or whatever, in this case, a psalm, and make some application to it. And this is one of those psalms where a lot is used in this in, in different, from different people. And so um, this is a, one of those internal things that we should recognize as far as the Bible is concerned. It is, it is self-validating. And, uh, and a lot of times if there are questions as to who is being spoken of here and why does this seem to have, you know, more than meets the eye uh, of just say you were the original recipient of it. And then all of a sudden something is said that makes you wonder, is there more going on than we can actually understand? This is definitely one of those kind of situations. And this is quoted very heavily in the New Testament. While we go through this, I'm going to want to go to those places in the New Testament to find out why. Uh, was this looked at. Now, clearly this is a messianic um, psalm, though if if we didn't know anything past what David had written here, you could say, yeah, this is this is stuff that, that has happened to David, and um, it, we wouldn't think anything of it. But because it is quoted so often in the New Testament for various reasons, this is where we understand that, that there are times when uh, a particular passage will have an immediate application when it was written, and to the people and to whatever else. But in, in internally with it, there are some things that are said that really will not have a fuller, a fuller understanding until later events, in this case, the person of Jesus. And so this becomes very messianic in, uh, in the things that it says. So it's really a pretty fascinating um, uh, psalm anyway. It is right there in this section where it, it has a lot to say of, the gratitude and thanksgiving towards God. It's expressing a, a thankfulness to him for what he has done. And uh, then you come across these passages and some of them you may remember, some of them you may have recognized when you hear them. Other ones are a little bit more subtle. And so you're gonna find that it's not just any one particular person quoting it, uh, it kind of runs the gambit. And so uh, you'll see that as we kind of go through this. But this is, again, one of those great um, examples of something that's found in the Old Testament that has the New Testament quoting it kind of extensively. And that's what I mean about the internal parts of it, that the Bible will help to validate itself, and especially when it comes to passages that really don't make any sense whatsoever uh, when they were first written, that they wouldn't make any kind of full sense until the New Testament was written, and then, of course, because of Jesus and what he had accomplished. Uh, Psalm 22, when we went through that, perfect example. Isaiah 53, perfect example. It really can't apply to any one person uh, based on what they had gone through. Now, as I said with this one, when we think about David and, and this here, as he writes this, you can say, yeah, there were those times when David had a great deal of difficulty and trouble in his life, and uh, it may very well easily fit in with uh, with... Uh, his life. And if that was it, we wouldn't look at this and go, I wonder if it has a, a deeper meaning to it. This is one of those where it's a bit more subtle, but it is uh, quoted extensively, as I've said, for the size of the psalm, how many times it is used uh, to illustrate a particular point. So really interesting uh, that we have that. And I want to uh, make sure that we say this or that I say this because I think it's really, really important. In the modern church culture, first, we have, a two, we have two problems, as I see it. As far as the church is concerned, we have, first of all, first and foremost, the problem that not many churches take the approach to study all the way through a particular book from beginning to end, every chapter, every verse, without making it a topical thing, just reading it in its full, full understanding, the context, Who's the writer? Who's the recipient? What's the reason for it being written? What's the era of time? You know, the location of where it is will, will tell you so much about it. And so understanding that really helps people to, to get a good grip on what's taking place in the actual text as they read it. The second problem that I see, even for churches that may very well take the approach, 
that we study through the entirety of the scripture, they will take a view of the Old Testament that it's less important. So they wouldn't take a systematic approach to teaching all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament side by side and uh, with equal weight and equal value. And it is when that is the approach that you will so often miss when you're even teaching through the New Testament. You might run across something and you know that it might be um, something that's taken from the Old Testament or quoted from the Old Testament. But if that's the extent of it, that you just acknowledge that it's taken from the Old Testament without ever approaching the question as to why, what is it about that particular uh, passage that's being quoted out of the Old Testament? Why would you use it in the New? You know, if you don't, if people are not familiar with the Old Testament, there's so much in the New that just doesn't quite make sense. And before we go on, I'll just give you one great example of that. You've heard me say it before. When it comes to what Jesus did and uh, dying on the cross for the sin of mankind, he had to do that. That was a, an offering that we couldn't even offer ourselves and have that be acceptable as far as God was concerned. A substitute needed to be found. And that substitute, the person who would take upon himself the sin of us was Jesus himself, obviously. We, you know, we know that from the, from the text. And that's what we would call the big 25 cent word is uh, substitutionary atonement. So he atoned for us in a substitutionary manner. And so most people don't need to be convinced of that. They may not be familiar with the terminology. They may have never thought about it that way. But if you just explain it, it's easy to see. I want to make sure that we understand, though, it's very important for us to catch that that is not a New Testament principle. It has been going on, as far as the, the Jewish people are concerned, since God put in uh, and implemented in the law the sacrificial system. So you can find substitutionary atone, uh, atonement spoken of in the first three or four verses of the first chapter of the book of Leviticus. The, the book that tells us what the Levites were supposed to do, and, and it gives us the understanding of their roles and responsibilities and what the law was about and how the priests were to do and, and what, they were, what they were supposed to do and how they were supposed to do it. But it's just the first chapter, the first few verses of that book deals with substitutionary atonement and that it's provided by the person seeking atonement. It is only going to atone for their sin. It's not for someone else. There's an acknowledgement of their guilt and they recognize what is taking place and that something innocent is going to be put to death because of their guilt. Substitutionary atonement. We know further from Leviticus that God says that life is in the blood and I've given the blood on the altar as an atonement. And that's why it wasn't to be drunk, uh, drank, drunk, whatever that goes. We weren't to drink it. Um, and it wasn't supposed to be something that, that we look at with, uh, with kind of an indifference because it was a foreshadowing of what Jesus would, would have to endure. The innocent being offered for the guilty and him being put to death for the sin of the guilty. So really, really Im impactful, important stuff. And if you don't know what Leviticus has to say about those things, then why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Why was blood the cost for sin and why all that? Well, an Old Testament understanding, we know exactly how to answer that question. And it should be something that is in the common knowledge of the New Testament Christian believer. They should understand that because they've studied it for themselves and they've actually gone through the, the study of the Old Testament rather than maybe some cursory thing that might have been explained when they were hearing about Jesus going to the cross. So again, it's why we take such a, uh, a, a view of the teaching of the Bible. Um, it is my personal contention, my personal view, that um, it, it's massively important that we uh, approach the New Testament and the Old Testament, as I said, with equal importance and equal weight, and that one is not superior to the other, uh, one is giving a better understanding of what was being shown as shadow in the Old Testament is now made perfect in the new. That's what we understand. So with all that as kind of the backdrop for this, uh, Psalm 69, let's go ahead and turn there and um, we will have a word of prayer and then let's take a look at the text. Father, we thank you so much for uh, gathering us together and that we can study your word and we can learn, um, see what it has to say for us and why do these things matter? And then recognizing that you had moved upon those who wrote in the New Testament to look back to this psalm in a number of places, uh, looking through it and, and making application in the New Testament sense and why it was important. So I pray that you would guide us in our study of your word and that you would be blessed 
and that we would be blessed as we uh, take the time to study your word and that you would be um, glorified as we take this time. And so by your spirit, God, would you make understandable to us what we read in the word? And we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So David saying this, and again, there's the in between where it becomes messianic, or it could be just simply applying very well to David, what you will do when you see the, the quote pulled uh, and apply to Jesus, it's it's to take that and say, you have the the initial uh, could very easily be seen as as fulfilled in the life of David, but the the genuine fullness of the um, revelation of it is really found in the person of Jesus. So he says, "Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me." I am weary for, uh, with my crying, my throat is dry, my eyes fail while I uh, wait for my God. Now, there are going to be some places that we'll see in this where you go, that sounds a little too human and the emotions of it and really what is it that causes uh, this distress in the person. You'll notice that later on when David says these things, there is the idea of iniquity or sin or something that has is just something that plagued him either in times past or, or as he's writing this. Those are things that Jesus would never have the problem with. Now, we know that there are times when emotion was, was high in him. We know that there were times when he was offended because of the things that they had done, the cleansing of the temple twice, different, two different times, when they had merchandised the children of God and Jesus drove them out, turned over the tables and all that. It was an emotional thing that he had done there. We also know that he wept over Jerusalem when he came in for that last time at Passover. And he says, how I've desired to gather you to myself. And so there was an emotional attachment that he had to the people who were rejecting him. So we see that, but it, there's never a time when Jesus experienced any kind of grief for some failing on his part. Whereas you'll see that David has those too. So even in the opening of this, the question would be, what is the reason for the grief and all of those things? Is it because of some internal fault that David saw in himself, or is it circumstances? And it's basically, as we read through these, we can determine whether or not or what the cause was. So we don't have to look at this like we would necessarily say Psalm 22, where we would say that it is almost exclusively messianic. This one has... Uh, really where I would say it would be this way. We would look at it and say, this is David, and yet we have some pulls out of it that make application to Jesus as the perfect fulfillment of what was being said. So if you have any questions on that, then by all means, contact me through the email as we, uh, uh, when I close this and you, it, when you get a chance to see it, then feel free to go ahead and send me a, um, uh, an email if you have any questions about what's the difference between you know, having the whole thing apply or just portions of it or whatever else. I'd like to work through that with you if you have any questions on it. So uh, he says in verse four, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. So that recognition that there's no fault in him at this point, and that would be going back to what the first few verses are, is caused in him a very deep anguish and a very troubled heart and mind and soul. And he recognizes that he's innocent, but because of the accusations that were made against him, he feels the necessity to pay for those things. Now, where he talks about they've, they've you know, hated me without a cause. That is also found in Psalm 35, verse 19. It's the same phrasing that you'll see there. Now, this is the first of the places that we find uh, this quoted uh, in the New Testament. So let's make sure that we look at it, verse 4, in its, in its entirety. Those who hate me uh, do so without a cause, and uh, um, they are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. So the charges that he has made or that are made against him, though he is innocent of those things, still there was going to be a penalty for it. And that's when you can start to see, yeah, this sounds really kind of messianic. So keep your finger here. Turn with me to John chapter 15. And when you hear John chapter 15, yeah, we're talking about Jesus in the upper room. And that's a big deal, of course, um, because that's the last hours of his life. Now, when you think about it, is this going to be Jesus that's going to be speaking, or is it John giving some kind of commentary? 
Well, the answer, very simply, is uh, it's found in verse 25, and it is Jesus who is speaking. Now, um, let's go up a couple of verses from it. And uh, remember, this is right after the vine and the branches. So he has talked about, I'm the vine, you're the branches. This is to the disciples that he's speaking exclusively. This is upper room last supper. Um, so just hours before his arrest. So it says this, and he, he transitions. It's important that we understand what he is, is saying here. And remember, everything that he does in the upper room is preparatory for them that it is, I'm pr trying to prepare, prepare you as much as you can wrap your mind around it for a world in which I don't exist physically. The Holy Spirit will pick up where I left off, but you won't see me face to face any longer after these events. And he's trying to prepare them for that. So how is the best way to do that? Now he says, if the world hates you, you know this, that it hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would not or would love its own yet, because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of this world. Therefore, the world hates you. So remember the word that I said to you, a servant is no greater than his master. So that's the setup for all of this. Now look at what he says in verse 24. If I had not done among them the works which no one else had done, then they would have no sin. But now they have seen and they have also hated both me and my father. But this happened for one reason. Well, not for one reason, but this happened and it was a fulfillment of what we've just read. Look at what it says in verse 25. This happened that the word might be fulfilled, which was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. So when you look at that particular phrase, you're going to find it in two places in the Psalms, one of them that we're reading right here, and it, it fits nicely context-wise with everything else that's said there. So in the life of David, definitely a problem. It's caused great sorrow and anguish for him because the people who are coming against him are formidable. And there are people who were close to him, who had a great deal of power, who sought his life. Same thing with Jesus. When you're up against the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of the people that were involved in that, the, the people who hated him were too numerous to count. Of course, he's God in the flesh. Of course, he could do whatever he needed to. When it, at his arrest, Jesus reminds Peter, I don't need you to defend me. I could call for legions of angels. So put your sword away. You're going to put somebody's eye out with that or take somebody's ear off, ultimately what he did. So, so what you see here is that this uh, this happened. Jesus says this. He quotes this. All of these things happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, that they hated me without a cause. And then he tra transitions his, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. This is to give them comfort. But just to remember that they're going to hate you because they hated me, and they will do so without cause. Now, we know it's not that there's no reason for it. We know the reason. The reason is because there's a spiritual part behind it, but it's not the cause as though they had done something wrong. Same thing with Jesus. All of the accusations made against him were bogus. There was no merit to them, but that wasn't the issue. They wanted him dead because he posed a threat to them. That's what we know from, from uh, just the, the, the way that it all played out. So back to Psalms. So... It says, um, verse 4, let's read it all together. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are the mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. So yeah, he was not guilty, Jesus, of anything. And yet there was still going to be a cost. But again, the reason why that cost was there, he was going to willfully offer himself for the sin of mankind because that would be the cost of redemption. Verse 5, oh God, you know my foolishness. This is why you know that the whole thing is not uh, messianic. Jesus would never say such a thing. There is no foolishness in him. There's no transgression. Oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O oh Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. So verses uh, 5 and 6 clearly would never, ever uh, apply to Jesus. So that's why you see you can transition between, um, in this case, the first one, Jesus being able to quote and say, everything that's happened and the people who've made the case against me, they do so without just cause. 
though they have a cause, their cause is to try to rid this world of me because I, I pose a challenge to them. But there's nothing of any, any substance that they can bring against me as accusation. In David's case, they could. And sometimes it was inflated, sometimes it was, it was kind of uh, fabricated, but David, by his own admission, there are times that I've done these things that has caused this. So, as it goes on, verse 7, it says, Now, because for your sake I have borne reproach, shame has covered my face. These two verses, 6 and 7, are very, very important for us to remember again. First of all, where does persecution come from? Of course, I bear the reproach because of you. It's not blaming God. It's just saying, people hate me because of my love and my, my care for you. Not perfect. Clearly, he's already said my foolishness and all the rest. But he also does something that's really cool here. He says, let not the people who also love you look at my life and, and have it be something that stumbles them. So there's a, a real importance to that, and it's why the integrity of the believer is such an important thing. What we don't want to do is profess to be a believer and yet make it where it's almost indistinguishable. Our lives and the way that we conduct our lives is just like anybody in the world would. By the things that we do, what we participate in, it's just as though, you know, like if, if your life is just the same as before you got saved and all the things that you may indulge in, sorry, but it's going to hurt your witness. Now, right here, David is concerned with such a thing. I don't want my actions to be something that stumbles somebody who genuinely cares about you, as <clears throat> David would say, as I do, but I don't want my actions to be a, a thing that brings a reproach. Very, very important. It's a great, great insight that he has here. So he says, David continuing on, <clears throat> I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children because zeal for um, your house has eaten me up and the reproach of those who reproach you have fallen upon me. In these two verses, there are three different places, two that are quoted directly, one that's kind of implied. So <clears throat> the first one in verse 8, I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Let's turn to John chapter 7. This is a great example of that as well. And yes, uh, I know that some people would, would want to disagree with this, but Jesus had siblings, half-brothers, and sisters. And so if, uh, if that's something that you're not familiar with, I don't have the time to dedicate to it. I've done it in a lot of other places before. But um, if it is something that you're interested in and, and want to see where the proofs of that is, that Jesus had... Uh, basically what, what is Mary and Joseph had other children. Um, Joseph was was Jesus's father in the in the uh, uh, societal sense, but in the technical sense not. He was not born of that kind of a relationship. It's the Holy Spirit who caused Mary to conceive. So um, the idea that, that Jesus would be born of a virgin was what the scripture said would have to happen. So not a problem with that. That's how that would work. But as far as after that, they were married. It was a married family that was there. And so there are plenty of places that you can go to in the New Testament. You can just prove that Jesus had siblings if you're going to be honest with the language and forget about what you might have been told in catechism or other places. So what do we see about his brothers and what they think of him? In chapter 7, um, we see that Jesus, his ministry is in Galilee. It says, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to go to Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. He had said the bread of life discourses and things of chapter 6, and so he comes back to, to Galilee. Now, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacle was at hand, so he had left from there, but now is the time. It's, it's one of the mandatory feasts that they were supposed to go back for. His brothers, therefore, said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, uh, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now, it's it's not one of those things about their, their believing in who he is. This is said more as a jab against him. Yeah, you're doing all this stuff, but the world doesn't know about it. So what you should do is go show it to everybody. Let everybody there in Jerusalem go ahead and see these things and take your disciple with them, disciples with you so that you can go ahead and do all the stuff there that, that you have allegedly been doing here. And here's how we know that there's an insincerity to them. It says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Now, I'll do this briefly. The, the idea of brothers, the word here is Adelphos. So it's brothers, Adelphos. 
And, and uh, the people who would say Jesus didn't have any siblings would say, well, they're brothers in the sense of, com of countrymen. Well, no, they're not, and they're certainly not his followers. The countrymen would be everyone around him. If they're Adelphus in this kind of a situation, these are brothers of his. So they're not just people that are there. These are the people of his own home. Jesus says a similar thing, that a, a prophet is not uh, welcomed in his own hometown and even among his own family. And so there are, uh, again, a number of places. That get, if it's something that you're really interested in, you let me know, and uh, I'll help you walk through it in case you have family or somebody that doesn't understand these things. So it says, Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate uh, hate you, but it does hate me because I testify of it that its works are evil. And uh, so he said these things, and again, they leave because they're doing their dutiful thing as, a, as Jewish people to go and uh, to observe the feast, but their hearts were very distant from who Jesus was in the messianic sense. Now, in verse 9, we get this, because, let's re read verse 8 and then into 9. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children because zeal for your house has eaten me up. So once again, this gives an understanding. These things all work together that even his own family, are they want nothing to do with him. They think that he's out of his mind. And it really is caused because he's zealous for the things that God had sent him here to do. And here is one of the evidences of that zeal. It's found in John chapter 2. And it is the one that I had mentioned a little bit earlier about Jesus cleansing the temple of the, uh, of the, the merchandising that was being done there. So we get to verse um, chapter 2, verse 17. Um, and actually, the Passover is started at verse 13 is for the context. The, the Passover, the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing their business. And so, um, again, I don't want to get too sidetracked on this. They had made a business of this because they would have, people would bring their offerings and have them examined. They would always find some fault at it according to history. And really, Jesus' actions give the understanding of that. <clears throat> the people were to go and to offer to God, but they were making uh, seen as a way of, of making it commercial. And that's what Jesus has the problems with. And so um, then it says in verse 15, so he made a whip of cords. He drove them out of the temple and uh, with the sheep and the oxen, poured out the changers money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And then his disciples remembered what was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up, a direct quote. So this is John's commentary after the fact as an eyewitness to the events said it was then when myself and the other disciples said, this is the zeal that has consumed him that the book of Psalms writes about. So what we're reading in Psalms. So again, this is John's commentary as he was an eyewitness of what Jesus had done in his zeal to say, you've taken what should be holy and you've made it merchandise and he would have none of it because of his zeal. And the second part of this, of verse 9, it says, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have, uh, who reproach you have fallen upon me. So again, David would say this. Let's look at the three pieces. David would say this of himself. Starting at verse 8, I have become a stranger to my brothers, and an alien of my mother's children, because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen upon me. So, because of his zeal, he is he is really hated by those or, or rejected by those, and it there's a, a cost to it. Now, from that, let's take a, a look at Romans chapter 15, because again, this is quoted directly. Romans 15. And Paul will explain why he uses this. Okay, so it is Romans 15, and we'll start at the beginning beginning of the chapter. So, in verse 1 it says, When we then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak, and not to please ourselves, chapter 14 is dealing with, there may be liberties that we have that those who are maybe younger and not as mature in the faith might be stumbled by it. 
So Paul would say, look, if I have a liberty and a freedom to do the things that I do, but if there's somebody that's younger in the faith that would watch me do those things and it would cause a crisis in them, I'm going to abstain from that stuff. Who am I to stumble somebody else's servant? So it's with that as the understanding, chapter 15 continues the thought. So he says, so let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. For even Jesus did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you has fallen upon me. So the people who would want to, you know, uh, Jesus would say they don't know me because they don't know my father or they don't know my father. So therefore they don't know me. And so the things that Jesus did in the father's name by rejection of him, it was ultimately a rejection of God the father as well. So from the book of Psalms, we see this just in verses eight and nine, three different places where you can see that there was a, a, a way that it's either a fulfillment. Verse eight is a fulfillment in the brothers of Jesus from John seven and two other places. It's a direct attribution and used those passages applied directly to Jesus. One by himself, where he's you know speaking of himself, or I'm sorry, the commentary of John as he observes what Jesus did, and then um, what you have of uh, of in Romans, Paul talking about Jesus and the reproaches, the people that were in their place of ultimately rejecting God, though they were religious, their rejection of God really ultimately came down to their rejection of Jesus as well. So then, verse ten, when I wept and. Uh, uh, and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. And also I had made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them. Those who sit yeah, in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of drunkards. Again, David's life, that that may be the case. And some of this does have application directly, though it's not quoted. But as you read these things and you think through it, if you have a pretty good operational understanding of not only David's life, but what Jesus went through, you'll find that there are some similarities. Um, the, uh, the Bible talks about um, Jesus as being one who is acquainted with griefs and though are, are acquainted with grief, and we turned our face as it though as as though it was from him. So again, Jesus being reproached for who he was and what he did, it's not a big surprise. And there's some similar, you know, when you think about this applying verses 11 and 12 and saying, yeah, that was definitely David, but you can see some similarities to Jesus's life here, though there were people who loved him and, and cared for him and wanted very much to see him uh, do the things that he did. There were others who absolutely hated him and wanted to see him destroyed. Now uh, we get in uh, verse 13, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the accepted, in the accepted time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation and deliver me out of my uh, out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. So David just crying out that in his distress and in his despair that you would that he, he's looking for God to give remedy to him. We think of Jesus when we got in some kind of similar way of this. Jesus was not looking to get out of what was coming, though he did say, if this cup can pass. But he also said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So there was a very troubling part of his life, very human aspect of it, where if there is some other way, but nevertheless. And here David is just saying, I feel overwhelmed. I'm just asking for your rescue. Jesus wasn't looking for rescue. He knew what he had to do, and that was to give his life. That was the reason he said it himself. We are going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be delivered into the hands of the Jews and then ultimately to the Romans. And and I'm going there to give my, my life as a ransom for many. So I think that's Mark, what, 14? So he goes on in verse 16. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. And so turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies and do not hide your face from your servant. For I am in trouble and so hear me speedily. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies, or, or so that my enemies will take notice of this. So, yeah, the enemies are the cause, but also, uh, at the same time, the deliverance that David is asking for would be seen by his enemies that they picked the wrong side when they see God's hand move in this. So it's just, again, you can see David here, very troubled, saying these things. And this, this part of it, 
sounds very familiar to what we've had for maybe the last, I don't know, 15 or 20 of the Psalms. There was a, a deeply troubling time in David's life when he made very similar types of statements. Now it says, verse 19, You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. Uh, my adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none for um, and for comforters, but I found none. And there are some similarities to this. And I got to tell you, when I read that, if I think that there is application to this in the life of Jesus, to think that he would have ever felt in any way abandoned, which he says some things that are kind of like that, you know, that, that no one stood with him. And again, as he went through the trial and everything else, that that sense, if it's a human sense, it would be it would be such a lonely feeling alone kind of a thing. And yet that's something that he went through. It's it's important that we remember in in his greatness and who he is. I mean, he's coming back as the conquering king of kings and lord of lords. That's future to our time, but when he comes to the earth the next time, he's coming back and he's not leaving. He's setting up a kingdom and then it will be forever. He will come for the church. When you hear about the rapture of the church, he does not come to earth. He is not setting up a kingdom. He is collecting the church and he's taking them to what he has prepared for them while this world goes through tribulation. But when he comes back at the end of that tribulation, chapter 19, he is not leaving and every eye is going to see him. So it's a much different thing. But, you know, when we think of him in those terms, it's wonderful because that is who he is. But to think that there were those times of just a very human feeling of what it's like to have so many enemies and so many people that just hate you without cause and knowing that he was going to do what he was going to do, the, the more that, that you can consider him in the human aspect, I think it, it really kind of opens our understanding about who he is but never robbing him of his deity. Because there is the danger that you could so humanize him that you forget that he was actually God in the flesh. There's that wonderful balance between the two things. But it, it's heartbreaking to me if in the human sense that he could ever feel in any way that there were people who had abandoned him. And you know that there were. There were people that would have done some of the most cruel things, though they had never seen him do anything that would warrant such a thing. Judas is a great example of that. So um, what we see in uh, verse 3, and it says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. We just read that. I'm sorry. So back to um, verse 20. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, and there was none, and for comforters, but found none. They also gave me gall for food, and for my thirst, they offered vinegar to drink. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should. It's from Matthew chapter 27. Let's go there. And I wanted to make it a point to actually go through each of these and make sure that we um, looked at the, the passages that were part of it. So Matthew chapter 27. And we are at verse 34. That's where it actually is said. But um, if you're looking for the actual context of it, it starts at verse 33. And when they had come to the place known as Golgotha, that is to say the place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. Sour wine is vinegar. Um, and mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink and then they uh, crucified him, divided his garments. This would have been fulfillment of another uh, passage, which is not from uh, not what we're reading here. It's uh, something else. It's uh, from was it Isaiah 53 or is it Psalm 22? Uh, back to Psalms. So there is the direct, you know, they offered these things. David says this, and this is exactly what they offered to Jesus. So it's, again... The Holy Spirit working in David to cause something to be said and uh, and and uh, ultimately fulfilled in the life of Jesus. So verse 22 says, Now let their table become a snare before them and their well-being a trap. Let let it be a, a, a situation that what they what they have confidence in, let that be the thing that fails them. And then let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and make their loins shake continually. 
uh, pour out your indignation um, upon them and your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in their tents. Let's turn to Romans 11. And when you hear Romans 11, of course, you're thinking about uh, what Paul would have written here. And that is in that series or that section of Romans 9, 10, and 11, where he is dealing with the nation of Israel. <clears throat> so, um, let's see here. Where do we want to start? Um... It's verse 22. Let their table become a snare before them and their well-being. Let it become a trap. Um, that's what, when you read that, this is uh, what, uh, what Paul is talking about here in verse 7, where he says, What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest of them were blinded, just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap. This is what we're reading in uh, in uh, Psalms. Let their table become a snare and a, and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down uh, their back always. And so that would be the difference between the believers and the, the believing and the non-believing Jews that there is a, a reason why they have rejected, not because Jesus failed in something, but because they themselves would not bring themselves to believe. So it says in verse 25, let the dwelling place be desolate and let no one live there in their tents. For they persecute the ones who uh, that you have struck um, and they talk of the grief of those who have been wounded. Uh, add, they add iniquity to their iniquity, or so God, would you add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out as the book from the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Interestingly enough, there are some who would say that this is alluding to the book of life that is, um, is mentioned uh, not only in, in uh, uh, the book of Revelation where Sardis is told that if you don't repent, that your name's going to be blotted out of the book of life, or is this the book of life that's being spoken of uh, in the book of Revelation chapter 20, and uh, anybody whose name was not found written in that. And there are some who would look at this and say, no, that's just a way that David is speaking about anyone who is alive. Uh, if there was a book showing who's alive and who is dead on the earth, let it be blotted out and let them be put to death. And since you can't make an absolute case for either one, either of those works fine. But it says, but I am poor and sorrowful, so let your salvation, O God, set me up on high, and I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. I will make his name great, is what it's saying, by, by magnifying his name. I will make his name great with all thanksgiving. This is really helpful, I think, for us, and we should really consider um, how it is that we express who he is. We want to speak of his greatness. <clears throat> so when we have opportunity to do so, we want to speak of him in that same way. It's not just we're, we're indifferent towards him or we're thankful to him. No, we want to see his name made great, magnified for his, his wondrous things that he does. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bull offerings, which has uh, hoofs or horns. The humble shall see this and be glad, and you uh, who seek God, your hearts will live, for the Lord hears the poor. And that's just a way of saying the needy. Does that mean in the material sense? Or does that mean that he hears the person with the broken heart, that poverty of spirit that's spoken of? Jesus, I think, addresses that in the, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. So <clears throat> there's this impoverishment, whether it could be of just the, the material needs that somebody might have or the poverty of, of their spiritual life, which seems to be a better understanding here. But just remember what he says, that there is, um, again, let's go back to verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with great thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bull. An ox or a bull would just be the offering. If God is looking to us and said, what do you offer? 
Well, there has to be the offering for sin, but what we want to be able to do is offer to him praise and worship and thanksgiving and, and just magnify his name because of who he is. Of course, with us, the sacrifice has already been made. We don't offer bulls. We don't offer goats. We don't offer rams. We don't offer anything like that. We offer ourselves as living sacrifices, as Paul tells us in Romans 12, but that ultimately becomes a situation where we offer ourselves in a way of, of worship and thanksgiving and, and, uh, and graciousness or gratitude, I should say. So he says, let heaven and earth, verse 34, uh, praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them, for God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah. Oh, what a cool thing that is. So again, David probably could not have imagined a time when the people would be conquered and taken away captive. That's probably something very foreign to his thought. It would happen with Israel. Um, in the north, and they would be taken away. And then it would end up happening with the people there at Jerusalem um, after his time, clearly. But the, the Babylonians would take them away, and they would be gone for those 70 years. And so brought back to the land, but always a province from that time on, never their own government. So from the time that they were destroyed, and, and uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, and they were displaced by the Babylonians, they became a province of Babylon and then of Persia, of Greece, of Rome, and then other world empires from that time on. Until recent times, till God brought them back, they've never been that nation before. So, or since rather, until recent times. But here we see in, in verse 35, it's either David being too presumptuous or it's God speaking through David and saying, even in those times of their desperation, just hang on long enough because this is the promise. God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah and they may, that they may dwell there and possess it. Also, the descendants of his servants will inherit it. All those who love his name shall dwell in it. That is a statement of fact. Whether he realized just the gravity of it, he, I, he couldn't have possibly, I don't think, believed that 3,000 years later, that, that the nation would still be something that um, is being spoken of. I'm sure he probably didn't think that humanity had 3,000 years, but here we are. And yet in our modern times, that is precisely what we see of them being given back what is their inheritance. Really, really cool the way that that is stated. Uh, Psalm 70. Here is David, and again, this is not a command. This is a request. It, it is, Lord, would you? Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and confounded who seek my life, and let them be turned back and let them be confused who desire my hurt. Let them be turned back because of their shame who say, aha, that's a, a way of mockery. So here's an interesting thing. And again, this is something that I have found myself praying constantly uh, since everything started to happen as it has around Israel and what's been taking place there. I have been asking, like David says here, that for the people of Israel, as it has been in the past, that God would, would confound and confuse their enemies and that he would give success to his people. And not for any reason, not, you know, without reason, let this be that God, or that, that the people would see that God's hand is in this and that they would have no other explanation as to how they could be so successful in something that could have gone so terribly wrong after that first day. So what I'm praying constantly is along the lines of what we just read there, would you bring to nothing the plans of those wicked people who want to do harm to your people? So give favor to yours and cause confusion and confound the enemies. Again, let's make, let's make no mistake about it. The enemies that face Israel right now don't just want to uh, beat them in war. They don't just want to see them driven back. They want to see them absolutely annihilated as a people. And they want to see nothing but their death and destruction. It's in their charter. You can read it for yourself. And their same hatred is also directed at Christians as well. We should make no, uh, no mistake about that too. So it says, let them be turned back, verse 3, because of their shame, those who, who mock, those who say in this mocking way. So he says, so then let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad. This is the contrast. Let those who seek you be uh, rejoice and be glad in you. 
Let those who love your uh, salvation, uh, let, oh, I'm sorry, let those who love your salvation say continually, let God be magnified. And so the salvation to them would be the deliverance, not salvation in the exact same way as we think of it, because to us, salvation includes the atoning work of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins, the, the ability to be born again and to, to have the assurance of salvation that from the moment that I die, I'm, I'm ushered into his presence. I have that, that promise that's been given to me. So with that, when we think about salvation in the New Testament sense, this even takes on a more glorious kind of a, a, a reading. So let all those who seek you, again, is this you? Is this the church? Is this in the application? Of course, he's talking to the children of Israel at the time. But as we read this and as we make application, could we say such thing? Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And let those who love your salvation say always, continually, let God be magnified. But he says, but I, and then, you know, again, noticing and recognizing his condition, I am poor and needy, so make help uh, to me, O God. Uh, make haste, rather, to uh, me, O God. The idea of being poor and needy, once again, I don't think of a king as being able to say poor and needy, because he's not that in the material sense. But it is good for a person, again, he's not trying to garner some kind of sympathy from God. Who's going to be able to try to pull that fast one on God? He's, he's not going to be uh, you know, swayed by, by things that God could see right through. So when David looks at himself and says of himself that I am poor and needy, there's a real reason why he would say those things, because he realizes this in the spiritual sense, in the day-to-day -day sense, not in the material sense. He's the king. He's got plenty of resource. So it's that reckoning of just who we are. It's wonderful. But I am poor and needy, so make haste to me, O God. You are my help and you are my deliverer, O Lord. Please, you know, and it's an urging. Do not delay. So when I read these things, again, David is a, a fascinating guy. Again, one of those people that I, I'm intrigued to be able to meet someday. And uh, if, if it is anything like our understanding of life, that there could be dialogue and that we could learn things there. Will we learn things or will we already know them? You know, there's, there's debate over that. But just the idea that, that a person like David, he's a complex interesting human being in that he has seen and endured an awful lot and uh and yet you you find that there is a real vulnerability to him and a real love and a care and a concern for how his life will reflect on god i think all of us would be well served to say those same kind of things you know from time to time as we consider thinking about the greatness of god and what he's done what he has revealed to us how we are viewed by him and uh, and the importance that, that his children uh, mean to him, but at the same time recognizing none of this was any, no merit of my own has caused this. I'm not saved because I deserved it. I'm saved because he loves. It is good for us to be reminded of those things and to, uh, and to walk accordingly. So we're going to pick up at Psalm 71 next week, and I pray that this has been a blessing to you <clears throat> again as we read through these things. If you have any questions, as I had mentioned already, you can contact us through the ministry's website, which is oldpaththeology.net, and you can send me an email there as you have a little drop-down menu. Any questions that you might have about that, about the study, about anything that you hear in any of our studies, uh, I'd love to have the dialogue. So uh, contact us through the email there, and uh, we will pick up at Psalm 71 next week.